Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 215 session in Big Mountain Data. And we will be talking about Apache Kafka, the crash course with Jeff Lewis. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the box to the right of the presentation or in the Slack room, BMDD underscore room and the number three. Go ahead, Jeff. Perfect. Um, so like she said, I'm going to be uh, going through Apache Kafka, a bit of a crash course about it. Um, a little bit, if I can get my slides to change here. There we go. A little bit about me. Um, I work on the data platform at Pluralsight, which uh, is basically exactly what it sounds like, a platform for sharing data um, across the company, whether it be between uh, different product teams or to analysts. And uh, Kafka is the backbone of that platform. So um, it's kind of been uh, a great learning opportunity for me to learn a lot about Kafka. And so this presentation is going to be a little bit of an overview of what Kafka is and how it works. And then um, I'm gonna try to spend a decent amount of time going over things that I've learned working with Kafka that you know I wish I'd maybe known sooner. And so I, I hope it'll be really uh, practical to anyone who's looking to start using Kafka or if you're using Kafka already, um, especially in like a production environment that you'll be able to you know have a few takeaways of things that you can uh, look at or um, uh, ideas to grow on. So um, yeah, that's me. And uh, you can reach out to me uh, at Lewis JK on Twitter. I'm not on there much, but if you DM me, I will get a notification or feel free to ping me on the uh, Utah Geek Events Slack channel. I'm on there. So uh, yeah, feel free to do that uh, during this session and I'll get to them after or uh, at any point, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, so a quick outline of what I'll be going over. Um, like I said, I'm going to start with going over what Kafka is and a little bit about how it works and its um, internals uh, without getting too far into the weeds. And then we'll go into administering Kafka. So like, um, you know, actually, if you're the one who's going to be spinning Kafka up and running it and dealing with the configurations there and then um, if you're going to be producing messages to Kafka or consuming messages from Kafka, we'll go over those as well. Um, a lot of this will probably be a little bit more on the administering Kafka side, um, just since that's what I spend a lot of my time doing is um, adminning Kafka and then building tools around it. But we will go over um, some helpful producer and consumer configurations and things to keep in mind uh, while you're using it. So right into that uh, first bullet point there, uh, what is Kafka? And um, I think that the most common thing that you'll hear about it is that it's uh, a pub sub tool. So you are able to have publishers and subscribers and you're able to put messages into Kafka and have uh, subscribers um, asynchronously receive messages on the other side. Um, and so that's a very general way to think about it. And um, I think in some cases, if you're you know, just connecting to a Kafka cluster and using it, that might be um, enough for you to, to know um, at a hot, really high level. But um, if you're diving in a little bit deeper, um, Kafka is basically a distributed log. Um, and a log, when I say that, I'm referring to the log data structure. Um, so if you think about like a log file that we have in a lot of our applications that we run, um, the log data structure is like a, a more simple and abstract concept than that. Um, like a log file would be an example almost of a log data structure, uh, data structure, but essentially a log is an append only immutable ordered sequence. So it's kind of a dense definition, but basically what that means is that you have this uh, sequence of records that uh, is immutable. So it can't be changed once a record is put in to the log, it can't be removed or uh, modified, it's there. And then it's append only. So you can't insert like into the middle of a log, you can only append onto the end of a log. Um, so this example here, you'll see, um, I have this little example log where I have uh, N records. And um, if new records were to come in, uh, you know, they would be N plus one, N plus two, et cetera. And that number there in Kafka is referred to as an offset. So that's something that we'll revisit, but 
An offset is basically just a number that increments inside of the log to indicate uh, where a record uh, falls inside of the log. Um, so I don't know why that slide came up again. Um, the other thing with it, like I mentioned, is a distributed log. So it's not just a log, but it's a log that is distributed. And so when you think about Kafka, um, you don't really want to think of it in terms of like a singular service, but rather as a, a cluster of brokers is what they're called. So um, in a lot of like distributed systems, you call them nodes in Kafka. They're referred to as brokers. But I mean, if you say node, then that's basically equivalent. So. Um, this is an example of kind of a really high level diagram of you can see, you know, there's these different logs on these different brokers that form a cluster and they're all all of those nodes or brokers are able to talk to each other and your producers and consumers would talk to those different nodes in the cluster. Um, but we'll get more into how that works. The, the key point here is to note that the log is not just uh, singular, but it's also distributed. Um, so Inside of Kafka, I think that there are three really main concepts uh, to kind of get a handle on for working with it. And they are topics, partitions, and replication. So we're just gonna quickly break down what each of those terms means and uh, go from there. So a topic is a group of one or more partitions. And so without knowing what a partition is, it's not overly helpful to have that definition, but um, that really is like the simplest way to put it is that a topic is just a group of partitions. And so when we think about a partition, a partition is basically a singular log. And so if we think of a topic, it's basically a collection of multiple logs that are put together. And it's, it's kind of interesting because when you zoom out, you can think of a topic as a singular log in and of itself but that it actually is partitioned into uh, you know, one to N uh, logs itself. And so um, it's, I guess, twofold. Like if you're just producing or consuming from coffee, you can kind of think of it in terms of a singular log, a topic, but also it's uh, somewhat important to realize that it's partitioned just because of the effects that it has on producing and consuming, uh, as well as like replication inside of the distributed cluster, like I was, talking about earlier. Um, and so when you produce a record to Kafka, there is there needs to be a way for uh, the record to know which partition it's gonna go inside of. So we know it's going to this topic, but how do we know which partition inside of the topic it's going to go into? And basically the way it's done is, um, well, first of all, every record in Kafka is made up of a key and a value. So key value pairs is what you're putting into Kafka um, for each record. And the way that it decides by default what partition to put a record into is by taking a hash of the key and then doing a modulo by the count of the number of partitions. So um, I have an example here of that, if that is a little bit too abstract. Um, so pretend we have a topic that has three partitions. They start with zero. So you'd have partition zero, partition one, and partition two. And we have this new record that came in that has a key that is just test. Um, so basically what would happen is we would take a key hash from uh, just a hash function, which is not overly important, but basically it's just going to turn your key into some sort of uh, number. And then we have a number of partitions, which in this case is three. And so we're going to take our key hash and mod that by the number of partitions. And in this case, that's going to result in one. And so that record will move into the first partition. Um, and so the reason that's important is because uh, the keys that you have inside of um, your records determine the order. So the ordering guarantee that you have inside of Kafka with a topic that has more than one partition is that all records for a given key will be stored in order because all of those records are going to end up in the same partition. You know that those records are going to be kept in order. So if you needed some sort of global ordering where like all records in a topic are kept in the order that they were produced, then you would have to use a single partition. Um, but there, there are downsides to doing that because now you're going to have um, a limited ability to consume that topic. And we'll go into that later. But 
Um, yeah, the, the important takeaway is just that your ordering guarantee by default in Kafka is just going to be every record for a given key will be stored in order where you can retrieve it in the same order that it was placed into Kafka. So the next term uh, to go over is replication. So we, we went over this a little bit um, at a really high level with uh, talking about the distributed nature of Kafka. Um, and also uh, this is very related to partitioning because uh, you can basically set a replication factor inside of Kafka that determines how many copies of each partition are stored within a Kafka cluster. And so if I were to set like a replication factor um, I'll actually have an example in the next slide. If I were to have five brokers with a replication factor of three, then each partition would be stored on three different brokers. So um, you can imagine why that would be useful is because um, if we're looking for a really high availability system, if we have a single Kafka broker go down, we don't want to lose the entirety of a partition, um, whether it even be temporarily or permanently, we especially don't want so the replication factor allows us to be able to um, have an assurance that we're not going to have any data loss, first of all. And then second of all, if a broker temporarily goes down, then another one of the uh, replicas of that partition can pick up where the other one left off. So you can have uh, minimal interruption to your uh, services. So um, quickly recapping, you have topics, partitions, and then replication. So a topic is a group of partitions. A partition is basically a singular log. And then you have replicas um, of those partitions that are stored throughout your Kafka cluster. And if none of that made sense, or if you're still a little confused, then uh, you know don't worry too much. Just a, a vague familiarity with those terms even um, I think is helpful. So um, with that in mind, that's kind of a, a really high level, really quick um, overview of Kafka. Just if you haven't seen it before, hopefully that helps. Um, if you have, then hopefully that was in line with what you understood. Um, before and I didn't uh, tell you any lies or anything. So um, from there, we're going to move into um, administering Kafka and uh, just going over uh, what goes into that. So you think of, okay, Kafka is this distributed system where I can connect publishers and subscribers asynchronously. There's a lot of really cool stuff, but if you've heard much about Kafka before, you've probably heard that it's uh, non-trivial to host a Kafka cluster. Um, which I would say is definitely true. Um, and with that, uh, this, this slide's very overdramatic, but the point I think stands is that, you know, unless you have a really good reason to self-host a Kafka cluster, then you probably should be using like a managed uh, Kafka or one that um, a cloud provider uh, provides out of the box for you, just because um, there is a fair amount of operational uh, I, I don't want to say issues, but just different processes that you have to be aware of. And uh, you get rid of a lot of that if you go with a cloud provider rather than self-hosting a cluster um, on your own. So there definitely are times and places for that. But I think that if you're just getting started and you're looking to get into this, um, especially, then you'll be better off going with um, cloud providers. And, and probably the most uh, common one that you'll hear people going with is Confluent Cloud. Um, but also AWS has a managed Kafka uh, called MSK. And there's a lot of others. If you just Google managed Kafka, you'll see a whole bunch of them. And you know, depending on your use cases, you can weigh the pros and cons of those different ones. But um, yeah, un unless you are pretty sure you know what you're doing and you, you know what you're getting yourself into, I'd recommend uh, going that route, definitely. Um, so with that um, in mind, we're going to focus less on things like what it takes to spin up a Kafka cluster and you know what operating systems should I use and all that. Um, if you are interested in that, you can check out uh, Kafka, the definitive guide. It's a free resource that uh, Confluent puts out, which is uh, the company that runs Confluent Cloud. And uh, it goes over in more depth uh, how to deploy a Kafka cluster if you're looking to do that more by hand. Um, but we're gonna focus more on like, you know, what do I want my cluster to look like, whether I'm using a cloud provider or whether I'm self hosting. Um, you know, how many brokers do I want to have in my Kafka cluster? Uh, what do I want to set replication factors to um, stuff like that is more what we'll be talking about. Um, and so when we start thinking about a Kafka cluster and what we're going to want to have 
uh, deployed, we I think the most helpful thing is to start thinking about as much as you can, how much data are you going to have in your cluster at any one time? Um, so for example, if I know that I'm gonna need to store like a total of 30 terabytes of data in my Kafka cluster at any one time with five terabyte capacity per node. So meaning like the most that I can uh, pack into a single broker is like five terabytes of storage say, then in that case, I would need to have a minimum of six nodes. Um, but that's assuming that I have a replication factor of one. So that's only one copy of every partition. But as soon as I bump my replication factor up to two, now I'm gonna need you know 12 nodes in this case, um, which probably sounds like a lot. Um, and I think that that's because 30 terabytes is probably a lot more than what a lot of people would end up uh, running into or needing. Um, and so, you know, if I'm just getting started, if I'm uh, new to this whole thing and I don't really know uh, for starters, then um, this is my recommendation and totally, you know, take it or leave it. You're welcome to, of course, and encouraged to your own research and see what works for you. But I think that if you're just kind of like getting your feet wet, you'd be pretty solid with three brokers um, and a replication factor of two, um, you know, that's gonna be a pretty good setup. But if you have like a lot more high availability requirements and you're looking to, you know, run a production service and you have SLAs especially or things like that, then you're gonna wanna start looking at like five brokers or more with replication factors of uh, three, uh, just because that gives you the opportunity where if like two brokers go out, you're still operating at full capacity, um, which is pretty awesome. So. I think that there, there are definitely, there's a lot more nuance to it. That's a, like a very high level um, look, but uh, it's, it's gonna come down to also, you know, like what kind of throughput are you seeing? How many producers do you have? How many consumers do you have? Um, and, and how much data in general are you working with? So th there's a lot to it, but that's maybe a good starting point, um, if nothing else. Um, so from there, like if you have your cluster stood up, you know, you, you've decided on your number of nodes and your application factor, um, a good thing to start looking at then is configuration. Um, within Kafka, there are a ton of configs and you can go to the documentation and kind of just take a quick scroll through that and see uh, they list out the configs and they give really great uh, descriptions of what they all do. Actually, it's, it's super nice uh, documentation in my opinion, but um, there are certain configs I would say uh, if you're going to be starting to use Kafka or if you're using it, you should definitely at least be aware of these ones, if nothing else. Um, so the first one is auto create topics enable, which basically what this one does is um, when a consumer or producer connects to Kafka, there's a setting, this, this configuration, if this is set to true, then when the consumer connects and says, hey, I want to consume from topic a or the producer connects and say, hey, I'm going to produce the topic A. If topic A doesn't exist yet, then it's actually going to go ahead and create it for you using the uh, default configs that you've set on your broker um, for uh, creating of a topic. And so the reason that can be problematic is because if you thought that topic already existed um, for one thing and you wanted it created with very specific settings different from the broker defaults, then this would um, you know, not give you that. You would create the topic with maybe the wrong settings and maybe it's not what you wanted. Um, another potential side effect of this is if you misspell a topic name and you think you have it right and you're trying to produce to an existing topic or consume from ex an existing topic, instead, it'll just look like everything's working when in reality, you've now created a new topic that you're producing to or you're uh, consuming from. And so, I think like uh, the default is actually true here. And I think there are cases where that could be helpful, but I would recommend setting it to false um, just for the majority of cases. So you can be more intentional about your topic creation. Um, so that's the first one. The, the second one that I would look at is uh, delete topic enable. And this one's a little tricky. Um, Deleting a topic, you know, something you don't want to do by accident. So I think that if you are in a situation where you don't need to delete topics very often, then you would be better served by setting this config to false. And then you can always toggle it back to true um, in the event that you do need to delete some topics. But like, uh, you know, if you are going to be deleting topics frequently and um, that's something you're going to you, you don't want to keep flipping that config back and forth just because when you change a config, you're going to have to do a rolling restart across your brokers just to get that config change to go out. Um, and that's not the end of the world, but I definitely would rec 
recommend uh, just thinking twice about this one, but it's at least good to know that it exists. So you can prevent yourself from accidentally deleting a topic and then regarding it um, later. Um, this is another one that's just really good to be aware of. Something that I didn't realize when I started working with Kafka is that the default setting for a maximum message size in Kafka is about one megabyte. Um, and you can imagine why that would be good to know if you're producing messages that are coming close to that threshold, but don't quite hit it. And then suddenly one day, you know, you have a slightly longer string that a user inputs or something and it bumps you over the one megabyte uh, threshold, then your producer is going to start failing out um, on that message. And so um, this is another one good one to be aware of just so that you kind of know when you're designing your payloads and everything, what limits you're going to come up against. And of course you can bump it up, but there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, second and third order consequences from doing that just because uh, if your messages are all pretty huge and you're trying to stream those, it's going to be uh, slower to produce and consume those because you're transferring more bytes uh, per message. So um, I think it's something that, you know, in general, you don't want to change, but just good to be aware of what the um, limit is. And I have two of those slides, so I really mean this one, apparently. Um, Cool. So that's kind of going over some of the uh, just broker wide um, configurations. And from there, I want to go in and talk a little bit about retention policies in Kafka. And so a retention policy is, you know, you have these records in Kafka and how long are they going to stay around for um, in there? Are, you know, are you going to keep those records around forever or do you have some sort of cleanup policy um, that gets rid of them? And so in Kafka, there are two options that you have for um, retention. The first is time-based where you can set a configuration, uh, say like one year or seven days or whatever you may want. And that basically makes it so a message will live inside of Kafka for uh, that period of time and then it will be deleted from uh, the brokers. Uh, the second option is size based where you can provide like a number of bytes that a topic is allowed to take up and once it starts getting over that limit it'll start deleting the oldest messages until you're back under that limit and it will continue to do that. Um, so size base is less common because um, it can be hard to predict how long it's going to take for a topic to get to that size and so it can be kind of difficult to understand. Um, you know, how long do I have to consume these records or how long are those records going to be there for in general if I'm working off of size. Um, time's definitely more common. And then I have this third one on there, even though it says two options, because there is uh, something that uh, Confluent, the company I mentioned earlier, who runs a cloud based uh, offering of Kafka, they're working on um, something called tiered storage. I have this really awesome GIF slide because it's just really cool. Um, tiered storage is basically a way of offloading your storage of all of your messages from being on your brokers to being in an object store like S3, for example. Um, and so that enables you to do a lot of things. And one of those things is infinite retention, um, but it also allows you to have like a more elastic cluster and, and a lot of stuff like that. So I think that, um, if you're looking to get into Kafka, this would definitely be something to look at at least because um, you know this this time based option can also be good, but you run into a situation where like let's say I have a, a seven day retention policy where once I produce a message into Kafka, it'll be there for seven days. That means if I want to have that data later and be able to access it, then I'm going to need to offload everything that gets produced into Kafka to another store. And so what that can do is if I want to get all of the data that was once in a Kafka topic, I have to go first read all of that data out of another store and then go to Kafka to get the latest and greatest from the last seven days. So it can kind of just complicate your, um, your setup for Kafka and force you to think about a few problems that you otherwise wouldn't. Whereas if you're able to pull off something like infinite retention, then you're able to really just focus on, you know, all the data is in Kafka and I can just pull all of it if that's what I need. Um, or I can start, you can always start from like a certain offset or a point in time, but you at least have the option of getting all of the data, which is uh, pretty awesome. Um, so compaction, um, if you're familiar with Kafka, you may have heard com of compaction and, you know, wonder how that fits in with retention. Um, and I'll explain what compaction is if you're not familiar um, in a few slides here. But basically, 
Kafka can clean topics up with either deletion, like we just talked about, so time-based or size-based um, cleanup, or with compaction, or technically with both, um, though I think that's a little bit less common. Um, you, you typically see it either um, a time-based or size-based or a compacted topic. And so what a compacted topic is, um, here's a little example. Um, if we have this topic here that has um, the uh, key that is just a string in this case, and then some arbitrary value, I have these, uh, these are the offsets, like I mentioned earlier, so zero through four. And you can see here, there's multiple of this key one in this topic, and then two and three, there's only one of each of those. If this topic were to be compacted, then what would happen is at a uh, configurable interval, um, Kafka would go through and clean up the duplicate keys from the topic. So now there's only, you can see one of the, uh, of that record, one of the record with one as the key, and then there's still the two and three. So in that way, you're able to stop storing um, older data, but you're able to still keep uh, the data indefinitely rather than having to worry about like time-based or size-based retention. Um, and so the cool thing about this is a lot of times you'll have a key that's like, you know, say that this uh, topic contains like user objects, the key would be the user ID. And as the user updates like their username or their password or whatever it may be, you're going to just produce more records into this topic. And so you really don't necessarily need the older versions of what the user looked like. You really just are more interested in the current version a lot of times. And so you're able to use compaction in order to get rid of those older records. Um, so you'll have uh, a few benefits from that. One is you know less storage burden on your brokers. And another nice one is that your consumers will be able to consume the topic faster because they're just getting the latest of each key rather than having to consume you know, up to N of each key. Um, with that, you're able to use um, deletions as well. So if you produce something like in this case, uh, you see key three, key three, and here I have a value of null. If you produce a record to Kafka with a null value, that's equivalent to a deletion. So when Kafka would go through and delete this, it would actually remove uh, this record completely and then add a configurable interval to remove this one completely as well. So key three would basically cease to exist inside of that topic. So you're able to essentially do updates and deletes uh, using that compaction uh, cleanup policy. Um, so with, with compaction though, um, you know, there's the question like, does will that work for me? And I think um, it's kind of a, a little bit of a hard one to answer because um, like I was mentioning before, it can be nice if you have a, a full history of all of your data stored in Kafka with some kind of, you know, uh, infinite retention to where you're able to pull all of the states that a user has been in. You know, you can imagine that being useful for something, especially like analytics to see, you know, how has a user changed throughout time or how has this object changed throughout time? Um, and compaction gets rid of that. So if you are gonna use compaction, you probably will wanna offload all of your data into another store for historical context. Um, another option that you'll see some people do is they'll actually uh, create a second topic alongside a topic and the second one will be compacted and the first one will be like a full history of all the state changes and then they'll write a job that streams the uh, full history topic into the compacted topic and that gives you a little bit of the best of both worlds other than uh you know more storage burden on your kafka brokers um so i, I think it really comes down to your given use cases and you know what other tools you have set up and are hoping to use and uh, from there it, it's just kind of uh, working back and seeing how you can use it or if you should even use it. Um, so that being said, uh, one more config that's good to know about uh, with compaction specifically is uh, the compaction lag milliseconds. So I think this actually defaults to zero milliseconds and what this means is that um, a compacted topic could get compacted uh, the second that a record gets produced to it. There are a few other configurations that influence it, but it's technically possible with this set to zero that a record may never reach uh, a consumer. If the consumer is a little bit behind and two records for the same key get produced back to back and then it cleans that up, then it will only see the second of those two records. 
Um, so if you are hoping to have like a compacted topic and make sure you get all of the data offloaded somewhere else, then you'll probably want to set this config to a higher uh, number so that you can uh, give your consumers more time to make sure that they get every record at least once before it gets um, compacted. And so again, kind of just depends on your use cases, but if you are going to look at using compaction a lot, that's a really good config to at least be aware of. Perfect. So that's a lot about um, kind of managing your brokers and configurations and your topics and their configurations. Um, and this next section is going to be talking about um, within the topics, like what format should I store my data in? And the reason that this question is a little tricky is Kafka is not exactly like, um, you know, a SQL database or something where you're able to, where you have this kind of built in, um, these built in data types that you that you use, like you have your different column types and you create a table and it has these different columns. Instead in Kafka, every record it is just a sequence of bytes. It's just a byte array. So um, your key is a byte array, your value is a byte array. And you know what you put there is totally up to you. Like as long as your consumers and producers are aware of what those are and how to get you know your format to bytes and then from bytes back to your format, then you're really welcome to use whatever. And so um, it can be a little bit of a tricky question and one with uh, far reaching effects. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the different formats and some pros and cons to them. And then kind of what I would recommend um, for using a data, like which format to use uh, if you're just getting started. Um, so a few common ones that you'll hear about uh, JSON, uh, which you all know what that is uh, probably. And then you have Avro and Protobuf, which are two binary formats. Um, and so if you're not, if you haven't been uh, really exposed to those before, you don't need to know a ton other than that. It's basically a way of representing data really, really concisely and without a lot of extra um, stuff stored there. So it's a really good format for storing large quantities of data in. And we'll go into that. And then CSV, I put half jokingly, but you actually do hear about people using CSVs. And I think, you know, there are definitely going to be use cases where uh, go for it with the CSV. But I think in general, it uh, can be a little tricky and uh, not overly performant to use inside of Kafka. So definitely wouldn't recommend it if you're using it, though. I'm not trying to shame you or anything like that. So um, we'll go into uh, JSON, first of all. Um, so JSON uh, does actually have something called a JSON schema that you can work with, and we'll go over that as well. But first of all, we'll just talk about like regular JSON. If I'm just going to take any JSON payload I want and put it into my Kafka records, um, the pro is it's easy to work with. Like I think most people who are in you know some kind of development job have worked with JSON or seen JSON at some some point. So it's easy to work with. Uh, there are no schemas in this case, which you know does make a little bit less overhead. Um, a downside, though, also to having sch no schemas is you really have no guarantees around what kind of data you're going to be getting as a consumer. The producer can technically put you know any JSON they want in there, and you don't have a lot of guarantees around what you're going to see downstream. Um, and also, it's a space hog. So with JSON, you are storing a lot of extra data that you wouldn't be with form other formats. Um, just for example, within like a, a JSON map, you have all of the keys stored there as well as the values. Um, data formats like Avro and Protobuf, because they contain a schema, they're able to get away from storing all of the keys in every single record. So you're saving a lot of space when you're looking at you know, billions plus records, um, having that little bit of savings per record uh, adds up to be a lot. Um, so JSON with schemas, you know, not overly different, but at least you're able to have uh, schemas. And the pro of that is that um, you're not going to leave consumers hanging, like I was saying before, where, you know, it's it's hard to know what JSON format you're going to be getting. If you have a schema, that, that concern is gone. Now we kind of know what the JSON data will be looking at that we're receiving. So um, in my opinion, that's that's a better alternative, you know, if you really... Um, are looking at using JSON, you're not worried about the space constraints, then I would recommend going with uh, JSON with JSON schemas. Um, but, you know, of course, uh, there are cases where plain JSON would probably work fine. Um, 
So now we move into a couple of our binary formats, the first being Avro. Um, the biggest con I'll just go over first is it's definitely harder to work with than JSON. You know, it's a new technology to a lot of people. You do have to understand the formatting of the schemas and just a few other nuances with it. So it is a bit harder, but once you're up and running with it, there are definitely pros like it being very compact, um, plenty of tooling around Kafka. Um, Avro is probably like, for a long time, it was the only format that was supported by um, the Confluent Schema Registry, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it's a, it's a tool that's often paired with Kafka. And so you'll see a lot of tooling, whether it's uh, you know third-party tooling or tooling built into uh, Kafka or Confluence tools, you'll see a lot of support for Avro, which is a really nice thing. Um, and then also similar to JSON schemas, you have uh, these rules that will kind of dictate what sorts of changes you can make between schemas. And I'll show an example of that, but it uh, helps your consumers to be able to have more guarantees around the data that they're gonna be receiving uh, downstream from producers. So protobuf is basically the same as, um, as Avro in a lot of ways. Um, as far as these high level pros and cons that I'm talking about, I think, a lot of it comes down to, you know, look at the two and see which one works better uh, for your use case or which one you're more familiar with. Um, those are probably a lot of the uh, factors there. Um, that's <laughs> that's just a, another point about the CSV, uh, you know, use CSV at your own risk. Um, so which one should you choose? Um, like I've been saying, you know, of course it's going to depend, um, but I think most of the time my recommendation would be Avro or Protobuf um, just because uh, it does have that really nice built-in schema support. It has um, a very compact data format and uh, there's a lot of tooling around Kafka that you can use that will support both of them, but especially Avro. Um, so I think that they're very solid choices and what I would start with looking at if you're uh, looking into using Kafka. Um, so like I mentioned, I want to go over schema registry and a little bit about it just so uh, you're familiar. And it's like I said, it's a tool that's paired with Kafka a lot. And uh, Confluence, the, the company that kind of runs uh, schema registry as an open source project. So I have that little shout out to them there. Uh, they, they really drive a lot of uh, the enhancements and improvements that come in Kafka and this uh, related tooling. Um, so basically schema registry comes in to a lot of benefit, especially when you're going to have a large number of people like think across an entire company or something using Kafka. Um, it's really helpful to use schema registry. And the biggest reason is like, it's a common place where it does exactly what it sounds like. like it's a registry where you can put schemas. So whether they're Avro, Protobuf or JSON schemas, you're able to store for a given topic, what is the schema for the key? What is the schema for the value? And so it really helps decouple your producers and consumers from each other rather than needing to go and, you know, ask the producer, hey, what can I expect from the data in this topic? You know, what is it gonna look like? I can just go query schema registry and see what the schema looks like and kind of get that information uh, right off the bat and uh, start working with it. And then the other really nice thing is that Schema registry provides the ability to check compatibility as you version your schemas. So, uh, you know, you create a topic and you assign a schema to the data that's going to be going into that topic. And then as time goes on and you kind of switch your uh, switch your data format, you know, you have a new feature you need to implement or a, a bug fix, whatever it may be, you're going to probably have changes that happen to the data format over time. And so compatibility strategies basically give you the ability to make sure that you enforce a certain amount of compatibility between those schema versions, whether it be backward compatibility, forward or full compatibility, um, you're able to check that when you register a new schema with the schema registry. If you uh, set your compatibility strategy to you know, forward and then you try to register a new schema and it's not forward compatible, then it will reject that and prevent you from kind of shooting yourself in the foot with that. Um, so it's a super nice thing uh, to make sure you're not going to break any like live consumers or anything like that, especially. Um, and then down there at the bottom, you'll see transitive compatibility. Uh, you can do backward transitive, forward transitive, and full transitive. And what that does is rather than just checking compatibility between 
the latest schema version and you know the the one you're trying to register it checks the one you're trying to register against all of the schema versions that have been registered um, through time and that's really helpful um, we'll go over that in a second but um, i just wanted to give a quick example of um, why uh, backward compatibility is uh, problematic in my opinion for most use cases um, backward is the default when you set up schema registry. So I think this is a common one that people will fall into. Um, and my recommendation would be to use full transitive uh, when you set up a new schema registry instance. Um, but we'll go into that a little bit as well. Um, so you'll see here, here's an example of an Avro schema. This one I just called score and it, score, and it stores just like an ID and then the score. Um, so just some hypothetical record. And so version one, you can see um, has an ID and the score, and then version two just has the ID. And so that change from version one to version two that I'm showing there is actually uh, backward compatible. That would be allowed under backward compatibility. The problem being, if you have consumers that are relying on that score field, then they're not going to have any warning that all of a sudden that score field is going to be removed. And so, um, you know, I said here, don't leave your consumers hanging. And I think it definitely is a dangerous uh, scenario to get into just because you're basically making every field optional and uh, your consumers don't necessarily know that or uh, rely on it that way. Um, so that's why I said, you know, full transitive is your new best friend because full transitive allows you to, the only thing you can do with full transitive is you can add or delete optional fields from a schema. And so if someone's relying on an optional field and you delete it, now it's just, not there every time, just as though it were still there, but just not provided in an optional sense. And then you can add a new field and, you know, it's the consumer doesn't need to know about it, but the producer can then provide it if they uh, desire to. So I think full transitive uh, kind of gives you the, the most uh, guardrails that you can have. And it's a good starting point. It's a lot easier to go from like full transitive to then backward rather than backward to full transitive. Um, if that's what you wanted to do. So um, this does decouple producers from consumers completely. Like your producers and consumers don't really need to do any code changes between schema changes or anything like that. Whereas with backward and forward, um, there are some different implications there. And then transitive, um, just at a really high level, the reason you're gonna wanna use that is because if you don't have transitive compatibility, then you can do a lot of incompatible changes just by making two schema changes. So you uh, can be really crafty and you can do a lot of things that kind of break the rules just in multiple schema evolutions rather than in one. So without transitive, um, you know, you'd have to make sure that all of your consumers were up to the latest schema before you made a change rather than with transitive compatibility, uh, consumers can be on any schema version and you can go ahead and make changes. Um, and here's a link and I'm going to post these uh, slides in Slack after, but you know, if you do want to read more about this, Confluent has a super great guide about all of these compatibility strategies and the implications of using them that I would uh, highly recommend looking at as well. Um, oh, and a final note, uh, with your uh, records in Kafka, I would highly recommend you use the same format for the key and the value in every record. Kafka gives you the ability to use different formats for these uh, things, but I would highly recommend not doing that just because certain tooling doesn't support it. Like certain tooling will only allow you to supply one serializer or deserializer. And also I think it can just be more confusing to communicate about you know, the different formats that you're using. So um, you know, unless you have a really good reason, I would recommend uh, same format, key and value. Um, and then, I did want to make a call out. Uh, another uh, thing that Confluent has been uh, working on is the, what they call node level schema validation, which basically makes it so that your brokers can check messages as they're being produced to make sure that the schemas that there are being or the records that are being received are matching the schemas that are supplied for those topics. So without this feature, you can actually even if you have schema registry, you can you can produce any record you want to Kafka. They're just bytes. So you can, as a producer, you can totally mess up or purposefully produce anything you want. And then your producer will see that and it will, they won't know what to do with it. And so 
node level schema validation gets rid of that where you're making sure that everything the producer sends to a topic matches the schema that's been provided for that topic. So another uh, cool thing to look into um, if you're getting started. Um, security. <laughs> security is a tough one with Kafka and I'm gonna try to just uh, kind of fly through this one, but I think the key point uh, I would say is like, if you know that you're going to need it, it's probably gonna be easier to do this upfront. Um, there are ways to add security into an already running Kafka cluster, but there's, you know, just like I think most things, it's gonna be a little bit trickier to go that route. Um, there's quite a few different options in terms of um, what you can do with security. Here are a few up here and I won't go too far into them. Um, but definitely the call I would make is like, if you're looking at an enterprise use case, you know, you're going to have like hundreds of people using Kafka, um, hundreds of engineers or something. I would definitely look into Confluence uh, role-based access control because they have an LDAP integration, which is super helpful. Um, if you're going to not use that, you're probably going to be using a tool or manually managing ACLs inside of Kafka, which is a really hard thing to do and something I uh, wouldn't recommend, but definitely possible um, if you wanted to go that route. Um, one more call out on administering Kafka, and this has taken the bulk of the time. So, um, but uh, metrics, I'm just gonna say, you know, JMX, if you're curious about how to monitor Kafka and what's going on, JMX is pretty much your answer. Um, we use uh, New Relic to pull those JMX metrics and then we can do reporting and alerting off of them, uh, but definitely something to look into. If you're going to use one of the cloud offerings, you'll probably get a lot of that stuff built into like dashboards and things like that. So that could help you avoid needing to even worry about that. Um, so a recap of all of everything I've just said about uh, administering Kafka uh, is there and I'm not going to go back over anything uh, for lack of time, but uh, feel free to reach out to me with any questions uh, or comments or, you know, if you feel differently about something I said, you know, I'd love to hear uh, your opinion about whatever. All right, we're going to go through now producers and consumers. And like I said, I have a bit less material on these subjects, but um, I think there are a few uh, good call outs uh, to make. So the first, this first slide shows at a high level what a Kafka producer, how it works. And so if you have your uh, cluster, your Kafka cluster, and this case would be a three broker, like three node cluster, uh, you have your partitions living on your different brokers and Kafka follows a leader follower model. model. So like we talked about, there can be replicas of partitions you can see here. This would be a replication factor of three because every partition is uh, living three times in the cluster. And I've bolded and written leader next to what would be like the leader partition. So your producer is gonna produce to the leader. And then you can see that dotted line in this case takes uh, what a follower would look like. So the producer would produce the partition two on broker three. And then if you know broker one is a follower of partition two, then it's gonna get that data from broker three. Um, so, that's just really high level how a Kafka producer works. The producer actually gets metadata about the cluster so it knows which broker to send the messages to rather than just sending every message to a single broker and then having it prolifer proliferate out. It knows actually which uh, broker is hosting the leader partition so it can be smart about where it sends the data as it goes. So quickly going over a few configs uh, to be aware of any time that you're going to write a Kafka producer. Um, of course, the key and value serializer, that's just going to be determining the format. And if you're using, you know, Avro or Protobuf, then uh, Confluent has some uh, libraries that integrate with Schema Registry and can kind of help you get through a lot of that quickly. Um, so that's a pretty obvious one. Um, another one with producers that you're gonna to wanna to look at are acts. And basically that's just saying how many of the Kafka brokers need to say, okay, I received the record before it sends back to the producer saying their default, like, or the uh, record has been received. And so the default is one, but I would recommend setting it to all. Like the setting is literally just all um, as a string. Uh, the default at one is, fine for some use cases, but what that can do is your Kafka producer sends a record to one of the brokers um, and then that broker acknowledges. And then if that broker dies before it has a chance to uh, replicate that data, then that data will be lost. 
So if you instead set it to all, then it will replicate out to any of the in sync replicas inside of the cluster before it acknowledges back to the producer saying that it worked. So that way you know that even if a single broker goes down, there's not going to be any data loss because that data is already living on multiple Kafka brokers. There's definitely a performance hit that you take when you uh, replicate to more before acknowledging, but I think that it's a good place to start and you know don't look at going lower unless you find yourself in a performance bottleneck of some kind. Um, the next one is uh, bootstrap servers. This one I'll be really quick about. This is just how you tell your producer to connect to Kafka. You provide a comma separated list of the host and port of where your Kafka brokers live. And the reason I wanted to include this is just because it's key to note that these are just used to discover the Kafka cluster. They're not used every time it reaches out to the cluster like an HTTP request. Um, and the reason that's important is you don't actually have to provide every single Kafka broker in your bootstrap servers. You can, but you if you provide, you know, even like three, for example, um, as long as all three of those brokers aren't down when your application starts, then it's going to be able to connect to the cluster. And then from there, it will uh, be made aware of all of the other brokers that it needs to. Um, so yeah, that's more just a call out on how it works, but um, that's how you'll connect to the Kafka cluster. Um, this one's really important for producers and probably the most important one that I would call out. Um, and it's retries and then max in-flight requests per connection. And the reason this one's so important is because depending on how you have this set, you could end up with a changing in the ordering of your records going to Kafka. And I won't go too much more into that. You can look in the documentation. I have a quote here from it, but um, just note that if you do set these incorrect, I mean, call it incorrectly, then you'll be able to get records out of order and then you'll kind of be scratching your head, you know, why are these records out of order? Uh, and it's because you had retries enabled and your max in flight requests per connection were more than one. Um, so last config I'm gonna go over for producers, is just compression type, definitely something to look into, especially if you have a large quantity of data coming in because it's going to enable you to have more data in each batch. Uh, Kafka produ producers send records to Kafka in batches. And if you're compressing the data before sending it to Kafka, you're gonna be able to send more per batch. So it's a way that you can definitely look at boosting your throughput um, and uh, hopefully lowering your latency as well. Um, so, and this is, this is the last slide I have on Kafka producers. This is a graph I think you'll see a lot if you're Googling about optimizing Kafka producers. And basically the principle is that um, as you increase the batch size that the producer is sending to Kafka, you're also going to increase the throughput and the latency. So depending on your requirements, if your requirements are pretty low throughput and really low latency, you're gonna to wanna to have really small batch sizes. But if you have really high throughput and you're able to tolerate more latency, then you're gonna to wanna to have a really big batch size. And then it's just kind of a sliding scale between there as far as discovering what your tolerance will be for um, latency and throughput. So um, it's a kind of the first place to look when you're gonna be tuning your Kafka producers will be at your batch size and a few of the related settings. And from there, um, it's a little bit trickier, but this is probably the easiest one uh, to start with. Um, all right, so consumers, and uh, I will try to get through this one quickly so we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, the main thing that you want to understand about consumers are consumer groups. And basically what a consumer group is, is um, if I have a topic with three partitions and I have a consumer group and this consumer group has only one consumer, then this consumer, if it wants to consume this topic, is going to consume all three of these partitions. But the nice thing is that a consumer group can have more consumers inside of it. And so as I add more consumers, I'm able to consume fewer partitions per consumer. And the reason that's really helpful is because these consumers can be deployed inside of different uh, like instances of an application if it's distributed. So you're able to horizontally scale your consumption of a topic. And that's why partitioning is so crucial to Kafka in general, I think, is because it enables you to have really great throughput and lower latency because you're able to have, you know, say 10, 20 partitions or more, and then you can spin up that many consumers 
and consume all of those uh, concurrently rather than having to go just one at a time like that first example that I showed. Um, and then it's important to call out that if you have more consumers than partitions, the extra consumers will just sit there. So you don't do yourself any favors by having more consumers than there are partitions, but it also doesn't hurt anything. Um, you'll never get a partition, a single partition sent to more than one consumer because then you're going to be consuming that partition out of order, um, potentially, which can cause problems. Um, this, I will go through a few more configs, and this is, I think, a fewer number than producers. Consumers, I think, tend to be simpler to work with. There's fewer things that can kind of be unexpected. Um, the first thing is just auto offset reset. And the key point to understand with this one is just what it means, which is um, as you are, whoops, I don't know what just happened. Okay, there we go. As you are um, committing records to Kafka, my presentation thing's going crazy. We'll see if it calms down. Um, you basically, a commit of a record is a way of telling Kafka, okay, the consumer has processed this record. Um, but if you've never committed any records for a topic before, then this then this setting tells it where to start at. Um, actually, not that setting, sorry. This setting <laughs> tells it where to start at. So whether I want to start at the earliest record or the latest record when there's no offsets yet committed. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and skip that one for now um, just because of time. Uh, and make a really quick call out for, I think the most valuable thing you can do for yourself if you're looking at uh, spinning up a Kafka cluster and testing um, you know, which configurations are the best for our use cases and such is to just implement some kind of load testing um, to test you know, as close to, as you can to your production traffic and as you change configs around, what does it do and um, does it make things better for us, worse for us? I think that's uh, probably the, the number one thing you could do in terms of if you are needing to optimize in some way, which um, if you're just getting started, you probably won't need to, but um, that's, that's the first thing I'd look at in terms of uh, taking things to the next level with Kafka. Okay, and sorry for the speed there. I'm trying to fly through that, had a little bit too much content, but uh, there's a few minutes left if anyone does have any questions. Great, thank you, Jeff. Again, if you have any questions, you can either put them in the box to the right of the presentation, or you can put them in the Slack room, bmdd underscore room and the number three. All right, it doesn't appear that there are any questions. However, Jeff will be on the Slack room for the next little bit if you do have any. Otherwise, thank you, Jeff.